Good evening and welcome to the Noir Edge Crime Writing Festival 2021. My name is Henry Sutton and I'm Professor of Creative Writing and Crime Fiction at UEA. I'm also the co-director of Noir Edge. I want to thank you for joining us for this evening's very special event, the Noir Edge Le Lecture with Megan Abbott. Noir Edge is a partnership between the University of East Anglia and the National Centre for Writing. Very special thanks go to our festival sponsor, The Crime Vault, our booksellers, Gerald, and Arts Council England for making this event possible. I'm delighted to introduce Megan Abbott and indeed welcome her back to Noirage. Described as the 21st century answer to Patricia Highsmith and winner of numerous awards, including an Edgar, Megan featured in person at the very first Noirage in 2014. I'm sorry we can't all be in the lecture theatre in person this evening, but it's fantastic to have you with us virtually and to deliver this year's lecture on the theme of true crime in the age of the docu-series. Megan has been pretty busy since she last appeared at Noirage, having produced three novels since then and worked on the Netflix adaptation of her novel Dare Me, three other adaptations of her novels, as well as working as a staff writer on the HBO series The Juice, devised by David Simon. Megan is in fact the author of 10 highly acclaimed novels and the groundbreaking critical work The Street Was Mine, White Masculinity in Hard-Boiled Fiction and Film Noir, which stemmed from her PhD at New York University. Megan's most recent novel, The Turnout, has just been published and is already a New York Times bestseller. Set in the misty pink hothouse of a ballet school, it's a completely standout novel of murder, sexual intrigue and very dark family secrets. Attica Locke, who gave last year's Noirage lecture, recently said, There is not a writer alive who is better at investigating the tension and threat of violence at the centre of women's lives than Megan Abbott, because no one else is looking at the violence from within women's lives as opposed to outside threats on trains, planes, in windows, or on dark, shadowy streets. Megan goes into the heart of female spaces and finds the ugly in all that pretty, the dark in all that light, with breathtaking suspense. The turnout has notes of James M. Cain and Alfred Hitchcock, but it's better because it's so fresh and unexpected, so wholly revelatory, this is Megan Abbott working at the absolute height of her talent. I couldn't agree more. There will be a live Q&A directly after the lecture. Do please stay to ask Megan some questions. I'll now hand over to Megan Abbott for the 2021 Noirage Lecture. Megan. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. I only wish it were in person. Um, so I'm just going to jump in. Um, this was a, a really interesting talk to think about writing, and I'm really happy I had the chance to. Um, last summer, during the heady, galvanizing peak of the Black Lives Matter protest in response to the horrifying series of deaths of Black Americans at the hands of police officers, a flurry of think pieces appeared, and Book World social media was briefly abuzz with the question of, is this the end of crime fiction? The headlines were often very clickbaity. Crime fiction is complicit in police violence, asserted one. The end of the fictional cop, vowed another. One New York Times op-ed piece by a novelist proclaimed how white crime writers justified police brutality. Initially, I find myself bristling at the hot takes thrown out there, as if crime fiction were both a monolith and completely in the pocket of the police industrial complex. True, I said to myself, there is the tricky business of the collaboration between many crime writers and cops. Novelists and screenwriters frequently call upon police to serve as consultants, to permit them to do ride-alongs, to provide critical details, all of which can tilt the story in a particular direction, whether intentionally or not. But implicit or explicit in many of these pieces is the view that crime fiction is inherently reactionary, full of noble cop and detective heroes and the restoration of order by story's end, a sweeping assertion that requires erasing much of the genre. 
When I first read these critiques, I said to myself defensively, this is only true of police procedurals, one admittedly very popular subgenre. There will always be a band of order is restored and that order is inherently just crime novels. And two stories in which one good cop or detective can make a difference in a corrupt system. But these are authorial choices, not the form's demand, or so I told myself. Viewed in total, crime fiction is a much messier genre, one that spans the whodunits of Christie to the wildly baroque and subversive Gravedigger Jones and Coffin Ed series of the great Chester Hines. American noir, after all, is based almost wholly under the notion that justice systems are flawed or corrupt, police are frequently on the take or sometimes even killers themselves, and even the detective hero becomes part of the nastiness, in Chandler's famous phrase, by the novel's end. And yet noir is full of its own problems, frequently glamorizing a poisonous masculinity, and classic noir with its one man alone against the fallen world ethos has been responsible for the other ring of virtually anyone who isn't the white male protagonist. But the conversation was important, is important, and is far from over. The events of the last year and a half have certainly meant most crime novelists and TV writers have had to look at the stories we're telling and have told, the choices we've made thoughtlessly, the structures we may have implicitly endorsed. We've had to consider far more deeply our own responsibility, culpability, and complicity in perpetuating troubling or damaging cultural narratives. As someone with one foot in one world and one in the other, it's been interesting to see the way this reckoning has played out in the world of TV, particularly the increasingly popular genre of true crime docuseries, by which I mean not dramatic miniseries based on a true crime, but actual documentaries in which the filmmaker examines an actual crime in details and in actions of real people. And I'd like to look at that genre more closely today because it is so wildly popular and has the potential to bring about changes large and small. There is a long history of important, thoughtful, expansive true crime documentaries before, going back to Errol Morris's groundbreaking The Thin Blue Line from 1988, and in 1996, Joe Berlinger and Bruce Sinopke's Paradise Lost, The Child Murders at Robin Hood Hills, the first in an eventual trilogy. Both have become classics in the miscarriage of justice vein. They were followed soon by Andrew Jarecki's Capturing the Freedmans in 2003, and John Xavier Lestrade's The Staircase in 2004, further milestones in the genre. But at that time, documentary features were, for the most part, a fairly rarefied genre, seen primarily in art houses, on public television, on the festival circuit. This was also an era when true crime on TV was dominated by popular reality shows such as Dateline, Cold Case Files, Forensic Files, shows I've consumed eager, eagerly even as I came to recognize the limits of their model, constrained by advertising, screen time, mass market conventions of the day, and in many ways reflecting an inherent conservatism in their view of guilt and punishment, the sanctity of our institutions, these stories have a form, a set of tropes, dead girls and foxy serial killers, beautiful white women and their abusive spouses, men and women with no record of violence who inexplicably snap and kill their partners, their children, noble cops who can't let a case, cold case go, stories less of psychology and context than of dread and titillation, stories that begin with the victim's body and move forward in time, never backward. Stories that are told in ways that reify old tropes, hoary folk tales, little red riding hoods swallowed by the wolf every time. And their very ripped from the headlines nature often means they bear all the prejudice of their era, expressing fears of a need to contain independent women, people of color, queer people, immigrants, sex workers, and onward. And that the experts, the talking heads, the tellers of the tale are most frequently police detectives, prosecutors, FBI profilers. But in large part, thanks to the true crime documentary renaissance launched by Morris and others, we now have a far richer array of stories that present far more complicated views of crime and justice. And we're seeing a pulling away from reality shows that may glorify police or at least only present the police POV, regardless of context or history or sometimes even the facts. 
In June 2020, Cops, the most successful p police reality show of all time, was canceled after more than 30 years, though it may in fact be returning, though only for non-U.S. audiences. One day later after that announcement, the same studio, Paramount, also canceled Live PD, its highly rated reality show that filmed police patrols in smaller American towns. In the same month, a moment when Black Lives Matter's protests were galvanizing across the U.S., the Writers Guild East, which represents screenwriters including myself, called on the AFL-CIO union to disaffiliate with the International Union of Police Association. It hasn't happened yet, but the often cozy relationship between writers and their cop sources and their police consultants have come under a microscope in powerful ways. But what's been even more exciting than what's gone away is what's newly arrived when it comes to true crime docuseries. The rise of streaming, the monumental success of a few influential series and podcasts, and the seemingly insatiable audience demand has meant a glut of these series. And what's been so exciting in the last few years is the deluge of victim and survivor-centered stories that explore the complex socioeconomic climate that often help foment crime, perpetuate violence, or at the very least made very problematic a simple view of justice or justice systems. And these series are coming at a time when the audience for true crime is never has never been greater. A, tw a 2021 analysis of streaming trends by Parrot Analytics found that between January 2008, over two years before the pandemic, and March 2021, the number of documentary series rose by 63%, and demand for them skyrocketed by 142%. Among those, true crime was both the biggest subgenre by far, but also one of the fastest growing. Why the rise? There are many factors. The pandemic, yes, though the spike began well before that. The dramatic rise of true crime podcasts and the high browing of them thanks to the success of Serial. The runaway success of the dense and sprawling docu-series Making a Murderer, which surprised even Netflix with its counter-programming during the holiday season of 2015, and which led to dozens more following its model. The rise of online amateur true crime sleuthing, leading in some cases to the solving of a cold case. And I think the powerful effect of a, of a few high profile, critically lauded and commercially successful true crime books, foremost journalist Robert Kolker's Lost Girls, which came out in 2013. It drew comparisons to Capote's groundbreaking In Cold Blood, but it had a very different approach to reportage. Punitively, the book is about the Long Island serial killer case. But what Coco really does is to reconstruct with immense intricacy and empathy the lives of five women working as escorts when they were murdered, their childhood, their families, the set of oppressive socioeconomic circumstances and institutional failures that made them vulnerable to both the predator and the investigation and the media coverage of the case. The prestige with which it was published both influenced and made possible many similarly oriented books to follow, but also reflected a sea change in the way the publishing industry views true crime. There have been many true crime books as rich as this one, but they weren't all published this way. Down market no more, these stories could be told in deep, nuanced ways, and readers would respond in kind. It was a bestseller. Sure, there are plenty of salacious true crime docu-series, or shallow ones, or merely deliciously seedy ones, like the early pandemic phenomenon that was Tiger King, which may or may not have taken advantage of some of its subjects and unfairly glorified others, among its other potential ethical or storytelling violations. But for the most part, I think we're in a golden age of true crime, and it's not just the volume. The range of stories has expanded, as has their complexity and nuance. The storytellers are more diverse, and their work reflects the way they see the world, crime, gender, race, power. And it's a worldview we have sorely needed represented on TV. And it's also a matter of whose story they're telling and whom they're relying on to tell it and whose experience or even point of view is given center stage. 
In the past, the focus might be on the killer, the predator, the police telling us how they crack the case. But now, far more often, the focus is on, for lack of more nuanced terms, victims, their families, the survivors, and theirs. Police are featured not as final authorities, but as human beings, good and bad, and mostly in between. And these series frequently explore police failures, individual and institutional blind spots, historically specific prejudices, and the very human mistakes that can sometimes have unintentionally tragic consequences. In short, many of these docu-series, even many of the most po po popular, are presenting rich, thoroughly reported stories that not only go beyond whodunits, but do at their best what we might consider important social justice work, and even at their simplest, reflect and inform a growing distrust of the legal and justice system in recent years, driven by these police killings, DNA facilitated exonerations, and the series of cases championed by the increasingly high profile innocence project in the US. All this is good news to me. Even as I've seen the headlines bemoaning true crime's popularity as rubbernecking, exploitation, desensitizing all of us, I'm familiar with all these arguments against true crime because I've always loved it since I was a kid at the drugstore reaching for the mass market paperback on the spin rack, Helter Skelter, Fatal Vision, both very problematic books. Um, it's now become a truism that women are the greatest consumers of true crime and countless think pieces have tried to answer the question as to why. I know because I've written a few, um, but is it really a surprise? And in fact, is that part of why the genre is so consistently diminished, dismissed. After all, there has long been a strong narrative that mocks the female consumership of true crime, like soap operas or romance novels or melodrama, cultural objects consumed by women. Uh, there's a tendency to repeatedly view them as inherently trashy, silly, small, petty. It makes me think about the stories Hollywood tells and the ones they don't even the stories they consider stories. Most of the female TV writers I know have, like me, been told by executives, many well-meaning and all smart, that the stories we wanted to tell about women in crime simply weren't quote unquote big enough. Not big enough. It's one of those Hollywood euphemisms that speaks volumes. In part, it's merely polite code for we're not that interested. But that even of itself is telling because in my experience, big stories is also code for male straight, male straight white stories, stories about low level gangsters, suburban drug dealers, Madison Avenue ad men, dragons, serial killers, all stories I love by the way, but they're considered big. They're about America, but stories about teenage girls and women, about their ambitions and sorrows, about families and their secrets, about the hidden longing of women and the traumas they hide, about the impact of violence on a family, about middle-aged women, queer women, mothers with desires, fears, aggressions, jealousies, dreams, about women who would be sidelined. These are all women who would be sidelined in big shows, confined to the role of wife, girlfriend, stripper, victim, but here they're given center stage. Yet these are apparently small stories. They're about small things. In a piece for the LA Times uh, three years ago, I wrote that in the wake of the Me Too movement, I've come to think of true crime, not to mention crime fiction, as performing a vital role for women. They serve as a place women can go to explore the dark, messy stuff of their lives that they're not supposed to talk about. Domestic abuse, serial predation, sexual assault the price of addiction, conflicted feelings about motherhood, the weight of trauma, partner violence, and the myriad ways the justice system can fail, oppress, and silence women. True crime is where the concerns and challenges of women's life are taken deadly seriously, and fear or distrust is not dismissed as paranoia, but valued as rational and real. And order is not restored, because there never was any order. The system was rigged against you from the start. In fact, as we see in many of the greatest true crime books and docu-series in recent years, from Lost Girls to the recent murder at Middle Beach, the crimes remain unsolved. The justice system or that lone male cop or detective did not prevail. And that's precisely the point. These series reflect the world women live in, where justice or even institutional interest isn't expected.
emailing me about the brilliant docu-series I'll Be Gone in the Dark, a mutual crime enthusiast male noted, how can, a, how can a man could write, rape 50 plus women and kill 10 people and get away with it is basically a primer on institutionalized misogyny. And I think I'll be gone in the dark, the six part docuseries based on that 2019 book by Michelle McNamara serves as a perfect case study for us now to look a little more closely at what I think is so potentially powerful about this moment in true crime. It tells the story of Michelle McNamara's attempts to identify the man she dubbed the Golden State Killer, a predator who terrorized women in California in the 70s and 80s, committing, as my friend said, 50 sexual assaults and 10 murders. In many ways, the series posed a challenge. It was a case that didn't satisfy any of the traditional features of a genre. There was no fascinating killer, no voyeuristic or lurid reenactments, no valorization of the dogged police detective. And while there was a powerful resolution, the killer was identified by familial DNA when the series was in production, but the resolution came only after the death of McDamara herself, who passed away suddenly before the book even was finished. And yet, or perhaps because of these elements, the story deeply resonated with women. Few TV shows in my experience have felt bigger in terms of exploring the vivid, crushing way fear is an elemental, relentless part of most women's lives. And the way trauma lives on in women and their families, their spouses, their children, vibrating through them decades later. Feelings universal among most women, and not just women, and yet never considered the story worth worth telling before. There have literally been three movies, a scripted series, and an extended docu-series about serial killer Ted Bundy in just the last two years, one just this month, and yet I've never seen this kind of story about female fear of male violence told with such rigor and understanding, ever. Informed by the way McNamara approached true crime in her writing, the emphasis in the series is decidedly on the victims, not their deaths, but their lives, their families, those who survived the attack and what it did to their lives and their families. And the series focused on McNamara herself, her life and her untimely death. Her obsession with true crime is part of the series itself and is treated with utmost seriousness and with a full understanding that McNamara is representative of millions of women who see themselves, their lives, and their struggles in the world of true crime. And it gives these women power. McNamara's important advocacy, raising the profile of the case, surely played a role in the arrest of the eventual caught killer, Joseph D'Angelo, even if the police did not even mention McNamara's name at the press conference, championing themselves for his capture. In fact, when asked, they denied that her reportage had played any part, despite the fact that they were using throughout that same press conference the very name she coined, the Golden State Killer, in order to draw attention to the case. What woman can identify with that kind of erasure? And is there anything more empowering than McNamara's words, voiced by actor Amy Ryan in the series, warning, even promising the then unidentified killer that his time is coming. It's running out. He will no longer be able to hide in the dark because, quote, this is how it ends for you. Open the door. Show us your face. Walk into the light. Revelatory. Important. I'll Be Gone in the Dark, both the book and the series clearly played a critical role in catching the killer. But a docu-series doesn't have to result in dramatic off-screen outcomes to be meaningful. As Errol Morris said last year regarding the influence of his groundbreaking documentary, which resulted in the exoneration of an innocent man and the imprisonment of a guilty one, quote, I'm sorry for the thin blue line. You solve a murder mystery and then people think that's all documentaries should do. In most crime narratives, there are so many more mysteries beyond the whodunit, which is what Mer Morris is alluding to, and they rarely have simple answers. Consider the recent series, um, Murder on Middle Beach, which is on HBO in the US and I believe Sky TV in the UK. Um, over four episodes, the filmmaker Madison Hamburg explores the story of his own family, a white, once wealthy brood in Tony, Connecticut, torn apart by the unsolved murder of his mother, Barbara, beaten and stabbed to death on her own front lawn. 
Rather than linger forever on the whodunit aspect, Hamburg chooses instead, as Cassie DaCosta writes in Vanity Fair, to look deeply into the matrix of interactions and institutions that make violence almost inevitable. We learn about the father's financial hubris and the contentious divorce that may or may not have led to her death. But far more fascinatingly, we learn about the secret lives and addictions of Barbara and her two sisters, the filmmakers Anne's, mm -hmm. and the complicated dynamics between all three women, from the outside, middle-aged, invisible by our, our cultural standards, and yet on the inside, writhing with pain and aspirations and loneliness and rage. And the docu-series finishes with no answer to the question of who done it, but it goes a long way to exploring the way a family can fall apart, fail, and how it might come together again. To that point, consider The Ripper, the recent British four-part docu-series on the Yorkshire murders that was for me particularly revelatory, knowing very little about the relationship between media coverage of those murders and the women's movement. The way the documentary reframed a story we'd all heard before to focus on the victims, the communities, the problematic police investigation and problematic reportage, even as it fascinatingly brings its own biases to bear. There's a great deal of effort to assert that many of the victims were not as reported sex workers, an assertion that inadvertently has the effect of asserting that those who were sex workers were somehow less innocent. So it's, it's complicated even in and of itself. And I think this is sort of representative of how these docu-series are sort of rewriting themselves as they write. They're catching their own blind spots there. Um, and they're, you know, putting these series out into a large clamoring public that can then also make these corrections. Or consider the recent Netflix series Jeffrey Epstein, Filthy Rich by filmmaker Lisa Bryan. Unlike the vast majority of splashy coverage of the case, the series is victim-centered and victim-forward, focusing in minute detail on the various experiences of the survivors of his predations and the impact of the abuse and the media ad avalanche that followed on their lives. It's also a horrifying story of the systemic and individual complicity that permitted Epstein to get away with his crimes for so long. Or another one, um, this one is on Netflix, American Murder, The Family Next Door, with its unique storytelling style. Its director, Jenny Popplewell, uses social media posts, law enforcement recordings, text messages, and home video footage to reconstruct the life and death of Shannon Watts and her two daughters at the hands of her controlling husband. It's chilling, vivid, real, a terrifyingly effective dissection of toxic masculinity, and we can almost feel it because of that storytelling style unfurling in real time. Popplewell insists we reject the notion that the husband just snapped, and instead shows a growing, intensifying pattern of gaslighting and abuse. Like the title itself, American Murder, The Family Next Door, it could hardly feel more relevant, could hardly feel, to use that Hollywood term, bigger. And according to Netflix, it was watched by 52 million viewers around the world in its first month on the service. There's also a marvelous four-part series, The Lady in the Dale, directed by Zachary Drucker and Nick Camilleri. It's a seemingly about a career con artist and entrepreneur in 1970s America, but it ends up being an exploration of the trans experience in the 70s and a, and a very unexpected take about growing up with criminal parents. In lesser hands, it would have been sensationalized or worse, but instead it's a tale both of a career criminal in pursuit of the American dream and a trans pioneer, the same person. And the series embraces all its contradictions and finds meaning and synchronicity in them. Forced to be an outsider due to the pervasive bigotry of the day, she makes the most of her outsider life. It's a big story, an American story, and the series treats it as such. What can these stories do? All aren't going to re result in changes in the justice system. They're not going to shake up a police department or an administration or a federal law. But they can do so much else. They can illuminate the lives of those whom our systems of justice persistently fail. They can tap into important cultural anxieties, illuminating fractures, biases, not just in the system, but in the hearts of men and women. They can change the way we view history, and they can help make us more critical and more empathetic, more skeptical and more understanding. They can help us understand our own lives. As Errol Morris has also said, 
however you want to describe it, the whodunit, the mystery of what really happened, the mystery of personality, of who people really, really are, is powerfully representative when you have a crime standing at the back of all of it. It's a way of dramatizing really significant issues. How we know what we know, how have we come to the belief that we have, is just absurd by the various mechanisms in our society. Is the law just? And on and on and on. Can crime do social justice work? Can it change the way we look critically, not just at crime and justice, but the, not just the way the media reports or fails to report these crimes, but the way we approach them as citizens? The questions we ask, the biases and beliefs deeply instilled in us, I think it can. The possibilities have never felt bigger. I also think viewers now approach these docu-series with a more critical eye and that the rise of streaming in our online world has enabled many to become amateur detectives, researchers, and analysts in ways both tricky and potentially powerful. At the same time, we always need to be asking, are we telling enough of the stories that need to be told? There's still an overwhelming emphasis on crimes involving white female victims. And I wish that one of the sadly countless stories that focus on crimes committed against LGBT communities would get the prestige multi-episode treatment on a wide platform rather than being siloed to the documentary circuit or limited to public television's reach. Instead, we're we'll, we'll still far more likely to see a sensationalized limited series focused on quote-unquote gay serial killers whose identity is, is often implicitly tied to their criminality. But we're getting there, doing better. These docu-series and their receptions offer the promise for so many more stories to be told, ones that we consider big, stories with deep and expansive takes on the drivers behind and the reverberations of crime, the conditions that can help perpetuate it, the prejudice and cultural nails that help formed and continue to hum through our systems of justice, and the fractures and failures and tragedies that result. And crime fiction must do this. The same. I now know I'm trying to be more thoughtful, diligent, and purposeful in my work, to catch my own blind spots, to push myself into uncomfortable areas, to reckon with my own biases and failures. And we all must never stop arguing for the bigness of these stories, stories about resilience and loss, power and its abuses, trauma and injustice, love and courage. There's nothing bigger than that. Thank you so much. Megan, Megan Abbott, thank you so much for such an insightful, smart, pertinent and illuminating, of course, lecture. Your, your line, particularly um, about the dark, messy stuff of women's lives, not supposed to talk about. You've been doing this in your fiction and now uh, you've elaborated on this in ways that the, the, the documentary world is, is addressing this. Um, yes, you know, we need to, to strive for a far more expansive and inclusive world that the, 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 the documentary filmmakers, um, etc., need to, to move into um, and audiences need to engage with. But your lecture. Um, let's hope this is this is part of that movement. It's it's been absolutely fantastic, a great pleasure and a privilege for us all. Just to remind everyone, please do order a copy of Megan's latest novel, The Turnout, and all her other novels if you haven't read them. She is my favourite writer. Writing today, we'll now be going into a live Q and A. So do please stay online, post your questions, and we'll be hearing more from Megan. Thank you. Good evening and welcome back to Noirage Crime Writing Festival 2021. Thank you, Megan, for joining us from Queens in New York for this live Q&A. Um, also, just to say, a list of the documentaries and docu-series mentioned in the lecture are listed in the YouTube description below. If you'd like to ask Megan a question, log into your YouTube account and post your question in the chat. I'll work through as many of your questions as I can in the next 20 minutes or so. To kick things off, though, I thought I'd ask a, a question or two. So 
So, Megan, you, you said that true crime is the, is the place where the concerns and challenges of women's lives are now taken deadly seriously. It's obviously a very welcome sea change where fear and distrust is not dismissed as paranoia. But I'm intrigued from your perspective as a writer and screenwriter and producer, how difficult it is it to make sure we're hearing the right voices in the right way. You mentioned the innovative use of social media in Jenny Popplewell's American Murder. How innovative can the docu-series be while remaining true to the story, the voices, and if you like, the victims? Yeah, it, that's the real question. And, and I think, um, you know, the sort of motives of, of going in, um, you know, this is a story to be told, that this true crime of these other true crimes are the ones to be told. Ha, um, you know, what are your intentions going in? A lot of these stem from a journalist, from reportage. Um, and that a, a case that a reporter feels very passionate about and therefore is giving a painting a very rich picture um, of people's lives that, that it's not about, as I say, sort of starting with the body and moving forward. It's actually beginning at the real beginning and understanding the socioeconomics and uh, and, you know, sort of these sort of broad stroke stereotypes that sort of always worked for, for sort of reality, true crime sh shows, which are the, these are the things, for instance, in America, this is the thing we know about the Midwest. This is the thing we know about Florida. This is the thing we know about um, uh, small towns and these sort of cliches that come up. And then this is this kind of woman. Um, and, um, you know, victims are always innocent and unless they're not, and these sort of broad tropes and, and I think that the long form, you, you can't sustain that with that. So you're already going in knowing that you want to tell a sort of richer, more complicated story. And whose voices are you pushing forward? Um, are you talking to everybody? Are you, you know, are, are you representing all points of view? Are you pointing out the, the things that can't be simply answered and exploring them. It's so much about having a really open curiosity and compassion for for the subjects. And, and uh, I think it has to like, all come from those those very real places to um, to ring true, to, especially because view, viewers have become very discerning. Thank you. Uh, another question, if that's okay, from me. So to crime writing and particularly crime fiction has long hinged on, on aspects of drama and heightened emotions while playing with fear, terror and suspense. I'm intrigued by the balance between engagement and how you drive and arguably contrive that drama in such narratives and how you can be more empathetic, more critical, more understanding, more true, yet maintain the viewers, the readers, interest yeah that that's a trick isn't it um, <laughs> um and you know so much of it is instinctual you know writing creatively um as you know i mean presumably you're, if you're writing crime fiction it's because you love crime fiction and and maybe you also love true crime and you know what it is in those books that that were so meaningful to you that mattered and they're kind of baked into your brain at a certain point um there's obviously some elements i mean for instance i suppose that it might a useful example might be there are a lot of true crimes that i've pondered writing fictionalized versions of, you know, sort of using it as a springboard. Um, and sometimes it's, um, I'm very interested in the story, but I don't feel I have anything to bring to it. Um, there's a darkness at the center of it that I can't penetrate to, to create a, a, a satisfying story. There's a missing piece. And, you know, I can still be interested in in that in that story but i'm not going to write a novel about it so a lot of it is situating yourself in 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 a really invested way and then just my goal always while writing is to try to imagine that i'm over the shoulder of the reader and i want them to keep coming with me and i want it and for it to be satisfying every step has to be earned so um so no no cheap thrills uh um and unless they're earned cheap thrills <laughs> okay thank you megan uh, a question from a question from from the audience from from nina 
Do you agree that domestic trauma is maintained in order to ensure women are victimized, demonized and controlled, that certain tropes of crime fiction are complicit with this agenda? Um, I, I would say they're complicit without knowing it. I mean, I think it's so deeply, um, so deeply entrenched in the culture that um, this is not, uh, and, and I know the question isn't saying this, but there's nothing conspiratorial about it. This is what we're going to do to keep women in it so deeply ingrained, these notions of, uh, you know, we, you know, as women, we find our, it coming up even in ourselves. I mean, one of the, one of the inspirations for my most recent book was the sort of um, response to a very successful and great true crime podcast called Dirty John. And it was about a serial con man and predator. And one of the things that haunted me about it was the comments on the podcast server um, and elsewhere all over the internet of, of um, it was um, comments, very angry comments directed, not towards Dirty John, the murderer, con artist, psychopath, but to the women who had fallen for him and how stupid they were and how could they not see through this guy. And they were almost entirely comments from women, which was shocking to me. Um, and I sort of became fascinated by how, so in other words, it's sort of, um, it's so deeply entrenched in us to sort of to, to blame put to blame women to blame victims and in this case I think um, as women we've been so um, socialized to um, always be uh, defensive and controlled and to never slip up and to never make a mistake but also to never lose control and to be the, the smart one and the one who you know to sort of be all these things are sort of impossible to achieve and um, and I think it's you know we sort of um, there's something very threatening I think about these the notion that this could happen to me so to push that away as a kind of pushing that away um criticizing the victims so i think it's like it's a really deep heavy stuff that it's hard to to get out of the way we respond emotionally to a story we're not you know we're not responding ideologically but we are thank you um this this question just in in the past year the genre has responded to calls for increased diversity of the characters represented in crime fiction and the authors writing it how can we help ensure that this is not just a passing trend for publishers but the future of our genre yeah i would say the main way we can help uh is with our dollars the books we're buying because a lot of this is uh, there's um is publishers that will will buy the books of authors whose books they think they can sell. And, um, and so I think um, leading with our dollars or our support in other ways, um, however, however you can swing it, is a real factor. Um, because in the end, you know, publishing is a commercial industry and um, they, they need to believe that they're going to be able to sell sell the books. And we've seen it every time. They absolutely can sell these this sell books with you know, uh, writers of you know, diverse backgrounds and experiences and that that often there's just i mean truly i mean it seems like a no-brainer that these that there would be you know because there just isn't enough of them that there would be this sort of groundswell of um um sales so i think the more that we can show our passion for these books when they are published and support them um that the better that's uh, that's because there's certainly the writers are out there the audience needs to to put their their their, their hands in their wallets. So yeah. yeah, thank you, Megan. Another question here: Is it really a sign of progress that often the darkest moments of real people's lives are being commodified in more popular ways? And when do real events become stories? In a world where stories and characters are being trademarked by large corporations, do people not deserve the right to the privacy of their own experience? <laughs> Yeah, there's well, there's a lot of great questions in that question. I, it's something I think about a lot because I, I mean, you know, there's sort of inextricable link between 
the importance of having a story told um i'll use the word story for shorthand but i want to get to that question of what makes it a story but um because it's significant and important in some way the, the storyteller the, the journalist the producer the writer um if there's something in this um but to get it to get people to see it or read about or hear it somebody needs to distribute it which means it's going to be commodified um it's you know that sort of um that's the way you know i guess you could just sort of um post your post your post the sale on social media um putting the privacy question aside for now but if you really want to tell a nuanced complicated story you also <clears throat> need support um to tell that story and documentaries are one of the reasons they're so successful is they're less expensive than scripted shows but they also do need support um and so that means they're going to be com commodified but i think what's really important there is the control that uh, creators and producers and studios need to exert in the way that their shows are marketed and promoted is there's like that can really get sloppy and salacious and misrepresent the story being told and going for the kind of cheap um aspects of it so i think i think <clears throat> that's changing now what a complicated moment because as i was saying in the lecture there documentaries used to be very rarefied um, and no money area of filmmaking. And now they're getting this prestige treatment, but is is the is that actually permitting more reportage, a better documentary, or is that just more about slick graphics and you know and a fancy marketing campaign? So I think it's really it's really gotta be on, you know, again, we can we can vote with our dollars by like not watching on Netflix the one that we think is trashy, not supporting it and watching the ones that we do, but I think really creators hopefully will, and have been standing up um, and, you know, really controlling the way that these are distributed, promoted, etc. Um, the privacy and story element is a real is a real thing. Um, you know, there are legal issues that are involved with a lot a lot of this. But once it's a public, you know, once it's a crime, it's a public um, you know, this freedom of the press, this is what, you know, this is a public, they're a public figure now, whether they like it or not, how intrusive um, these stories can be. This is a real issue. I mean, Amanda Knox, who, as you may know, was sort of, uh, uh, was a, you know, went to prison for uh, crimes she didn't commit, um, for whom there was DNA that proved it was another person, and and now she's exonerated. But she still she could not change that story. Every time people talk about a man, Max, they're not they're almost ninety percent of the time not talking about the exonerated person who was unjustly imprisoned for years, but they talk about her as the as the killer <laughs> um and it, it is a real it is a real tangled ethical dilemma um that's usually in the air you know area of the the journalist or, or filmmaker um but in these you know and often in the cases with um scripted series that are based on true crimes there's a lot of um legal considerations and getting the rights um and things like that but it is it is very complicated um and one one should tread with great care is this really worth it for what it might do to someone's life thank you another not unrelated question how do we ethically write about any negative experience especially when it's an experience in which we have not participated i don't believe stories belong to identities but do think it's a tricky one it is and what are you doing it for uh, i mean if we only wrote about the things that happened to us for most of us would be, it would be really you know inevitably it's the imaginative experience but are you exploiting an experience that was not yours and is, is specific to a, a group that um endured say an, an atrocity um um it's very you know what are you doing it for how are you imagining your way into it of this the way you're telling um it, it, are you using it for a story you know for a twist in the story or a, a back out story element or are you really doing it to for a purpose and i think being mindful of all that is is critical if we didn't write about dark things we wouldn't be doing our job you know this is you know we would be 
there's increasing the stigma and shame about about these these things that have been kept under the rug for so long but um but if it's it's you know i mean this is sort of one of the things that have been very much discussed about like taking on a, another ethnicity first person in a book and talk, you know i mean it is always very tricky and i think the big question is always oh, what am i doing this for what am i bringing to this um and i think we all need to do those interrogations now and i know i have been doing it and um it really sort of you see how you know how much do i care about this story and how much do i think what i could say about it brings is, is just it's got to be one of the very early steps thank you um a question from from paul here in the uk true crime seems to have morphed into dramatic adaptations of true crime stories how can dramatists retain that level of empathy authenticity when elements of fiction are introduced yeah, I, I, I've been working on an adaptation of a real story. So I've thought of this so much in the past year. Um, and, and, you know, this is a case where, um, you know, where the family involved are, are involved in it. And, you know, there's extensive interviews and reportage and it's constantly doing checks on your heart. Um, there's things, you know, you, every choice you have to, um, you know, it's a tricky thing. In some ways you have to forget reality because some ways you're not actually telling re the real story by telling the real story. You know, sometimes if, you know, there, there's a larger thrust to the story that needs to be conveyed. So you're collapsing two events into one, say, or two people in real life, two cops become one cop or like these sort of, like, but each time I think you do have to, to say, is there something I'm losing in doing this? Oh, oh, but, uh, or am I gaining more? Am I, you know, this, this actually took place over three days and I'm making it one day because it's for, it's for the effect. Yes, you could say it's for dramatic effect, but it's also for the effect of showing the sort of pressure and stresses and anxieties on a person in a particular thing, you know, in a particular circumstance circumstance. So I think all of those questions you have to think about um, a lot and be and really stand by what you think that, you know, why am I telling this story? Am I being true to this? Sort of having your mission statement in mind. And the only thing that should veer you from it is getting more information or more insight from the people involved. Um, other than that, you know, it's again, sort of, you know, try, you know, be, you know, hopefully you you know you are the right match for the story but i think you really are if you can get to get through that gauntlet of to have tests with yourself um and be able to justify the fictionalized moments that you do have in there um i think these are all you know we used to be very free with this stuff and myself included and then not anymore Thank you. A, a not unrelated question, actually, uh, from, from Tom. Can modern crime novels compete with the complex temporal simultaneity of the recent hit teen crime show Cruel Summer? Can the novel better convey how disruptive borderless time feels for us all now? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that show draws on novels more than anything. I mean, um, because it, because those shifting timelines is a very common novelistic device. I think, um, you know, and not uncommon in movies either. I think the 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 notion that it would help to convey. I mean, that's a show that's set in the '90s, so it's really um, not now. So the fact that it feels contemporary is a testament to how some things don't change and and. And, you know, the uh, social media and, you know, growing up online has definitely intensified um, issues of, of privacy and shame and stigma and identity. Um, but those were, have always been part of being being young. Um, so I think I think really there, especially with crime fiction, I mean, I've had this, you know, I've written several novels that have teen characters and and it's always like you have to kind of explain why teenage teenage girls in this case would be interesting and i don't know anybody more interesting than teenage girls and so you know some of it i think there's uh there's a little bit of a stigma um with that that uh, i think is changing too but but i think in terms of what that show could do well it's you know people have been doing that in novels since james joyce so i think it will uh, i think uh i 
I think um, it's making use of it more um, in by really trying to really convey the experience of being young now is really just a matter of writers choosing to write those stories and publishers choosing to publish them. I know I've been writing them. Thank you. Um, the questions, it's interesting, they're, they're shifting to to fiction now um, in a very interesting way. So so the question here, where do you see the genre going from here? Having all of us been so isolated, fragmented and internalised for 18 months, what might the crime novel do with Boy. that, do you think? Yeah, that's a great question. I feel like it's coming in novels already a little bit in furtive ways, which I think is the best way. I mean, I would never write or want to read a novel coming out now about now. <laughs> It's just me because I don't think we're out of it yet. But I do think we've all become much more closely acquainted, even if we already were much more closely acquainted with um, an extended period of fear and anxiety um, and what that can do to you, um, what that can do to your to your body and your mind and um, and your values and your uh, ability to make decisions and your emotions. And I think that's going to come in first. And and I think um, I think that there's going to be, you know, I mean, I think that's a big part of the future. I think the other big parts are going back a little bit to the lectures. This was already happening, but I do think there's going to, it's going to be really hard to do a traditional series about a, you know, a tortured white cop haunted by his past who has a lost love who uh, may or may not be dead. Uh, and listen, I love those books. Man. Those books got me writing. But I think there's like, I think really tra traditional um, novels about, you know, with a very um, traditional view of, of, you know, right and wrong, police, you know, good guys, um, and um, one man can solve these problems on his own. And like that kind of stuff has, are, has been going away for a long time, but I think it maybe got an extra shove, I think, in the last few years. And I think, um, but I think uh, certainly the detect traditional detective novel, let's scratch traditional, but I wish me a, a novel about detect a series about detectives. I mean, that's definitely been a, having exciting diversification in the last few years. And so I think these the form is strong and what's and can, you know, it can, you know, stretch for all these things that we we want it to stretch for. Um, so I think I think that's that's something that's happening now, too. But the the. Um, you know what the pandemic and it, and and in both both here and there what the um political dynamic in the use last few years are definitely going to roll into the books and already are and 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 you know how um how they're handled it will be really interesting to see a, a, a question from Nathan, and this is nearly the last question we, we have time for, but it's a, it's a it's a pertinent one, I think, and 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 again, not unrelated to, to to the previous question. Hi, Megan. Thanks for that wonderful lecture. I first came to your work via your early neo noir novels and your academic monograph. What is it about noir that interests you as a mode? Also, he adds, and do you think you'll ever return to historical fiction? Okay. Uh, yeah, that's so nice. Um, uh, uh, thank you, Nathan. Um, you know, I, I, for me, it's always, um, for me, I'm always writing noir because they're, they're all books about, uh, the kind of primal, primal urges and instincts that we all have and that exist through, you know, lust, desire, revenge, greed, uh, um, um, all these sort of things that are always be there that have been there since the beginning and um you know when when in a situation where these are sort of pushed pushed and pushed until there's there's violence uh and i don't think i i mean number one i will i don't think i'll ever get tired of that those are the stories i want to tell um and um and you know what people what people do um and what they're capable of and what they are and their resilience and their messiness and their demons and um so i don't think i'll ever stop writing that i would love to write another historical one i mean i i mean the honest truth is that i could just watch 
movies made between 1941 and 1955 uh, um, uh, forever and would always, uh, you know, I, I never stopped watching noir. So, um, to, you know, <clears throat> period noir, historical noir. Um, so I hope to one day, I certainly do. Um, it was good for me to take a break um just kind of stretch yourself and take some risks and take some chances um but I'll, I'll i'll find my way back thank you uh and the last question i think which is perhaps the question we all want to ask um has just come in do you think you will ever write true crime you you mentioned you were working on adaptation <laughs> but do you think you will ever write true crime megan abbott well, my agent always asks me this i i would love to I, as the main thing i would love to do but i i uh but i i do uh i don't know if i have the stick to it in this that real true crime um authors have and i certainly don't have the ability to call people up on the phone and ask them intrusive questions about their lives so there's my introvert factor with me um it might have to be a case so old that it's all um everyone's dead <laughs> so, yeah, I don't rule it out. I would love to do it. I have to admit that this this TV adaptation is is a, has been a great excuse to uh, to see what I can do, and I have loved doing it. So, so maybe, maybe <laughs> historical true crime that might be there. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. Everyone's dead, and there's all it's all. I can just read everything. <laughs> Okay, Megan Abbott, thank you so much for being with us live. Uh, we, we really appreciate it. And of course, thank you for, for such an incredible lecture. Um, it, 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 was, it was incredible and it will be there online for, for everyone to view again and to pass on. So, so please do that. Um, you can buy books, copies of Megan's books at www.gerald.co.uk and a link to the online store will be posted in the chat now um so um it just comes to me to say again and on behalf of the audience here um thank you so much for the lecture thank you so much for being with us this evening and good luck with with your um non-fiction adaptation good luck with your <laughs> fiction and 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 the next few writing endeavors. So I know you'll thank be hugely you. productive. So anyway, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. And those questions were great and really, really, really uh, were real head scratchers. And this has been just a delight from beginning to end. I hope to be there in person at some point in the future. You're, you're always welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, everyone. Good night. <laughs>